It's a wonderful time. It's a marvelous time. You know, we, tradition has it that Jesus was born this morning, last, this morning eve, whenever it was, we fuss and fight over the date. It doesn't matter. Some people say they have proof that it definitely was December 25. It doesn't matter. We can get so wound up in whether it was that time, how many wise men there were, how much money came in, that we totally end up forgetting what it's truly all about. The point is, Jesus came. But I want us all to remember that that was not the beginning of Jesus. Jesus always existed. Jesus always was. In John, it tells us, John chapter 1, John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus and the Word are one. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld him. We beheld his glory. You see, Jesus is spirit. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And Jesus was with God as spirit. So he always existed. But in order to walk in this earth, in order to be our savior, he needed a human body. Because only people, only living creatures, people with flesh, blood, and bone, have any authority and dominion in the earth. Which is the only reason Jesus could become the perfect sacrifice for us. And in John chapter 1 and verse um, 14, it says, and the word was made flesh, and that's what we're celebrating. The flesh body, the human body of Jesus. And the flesh was made, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth came by Jesus. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Next verse. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Think about this for a moment. Jesus made the worlds. Jesus didn't just come into existence when he took on flesh and was born in Bethlehem and placed in a manger. That wasn't his start. He made the worlds. He came to serve what he made, you and me. He came as a servant. He came and was born with a human flesh body for the purpose of suffering what we suffered so we wouldn't have to go to hell. His purpose was to be crucified, take the stripes on his body, go into hell for you and me. Can you imagine, you create something, you're the author of it, and then you become what you created in order to save what you created. And that's what Jesus did for us. He created the worlds. And in Hebrews, let's look at that Hebrews 1 again. Hebrews 1, chap chapter 1. He spoke by the prophets, verse 2. He speaks to us by his son. You want to know what God's saying? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus and you know what God is saying because he is the way, the truth, and the life. I want to remind you today there's no way to God the Father except by Jesus. No other religion, no other way, only Jesus. He is appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the world. We are one with Christ and because of what Jesus did, which was started in his birth in Bethlehem, he ended up being crucified, he rose from the dead, and he was appointed heir of all things. 
but we're in Christ, so who shares his heirship? Because of him, you and I are joint heirs with him. Verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. You want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. Look to Jesus. People have said, oh, if I could only see God. Well, we know Jesus came on this earth. He walked. He healed all. He prospered all. Everything he touched was made whole. You want to know what God the Father's like? Look to Jesus. God is good. There is zero evil, zero darkness, zero bad, zero sickness, zero disease, zero poverty in God the Father. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. His word is so powerful, everything's held together. If he ever broke his word, this world would fly apart. So everything he has said in his word, every promise he has made to you and me, is yea and amen in Jesus. And if he didn't keep his word, this world would fall apart. Because everything's upheld by the word of his power. His power is in his word. And you take his word and you speak his word and you release the power of Almighty God. And healing and prosperity and deliverance always flows forth with his word. When he had himself purged our sins, nobody could be good enough. You and I were not good enough. We could not save ourselves, no matter what we did, how much we did. We were not good enough. Only Jesus could purge us by his blood and make us whole. And he did a perfect work because when he finished, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. It was perfect. What Jesus did was perfect. You and I, with all our good works, with all our good intentions, no matter what we might think, cannot add one little bit to what Jesus did. We don't have to help God. Jesus did it all. We have one thing to do is just believe what he did. Trust him in what he did. You see, Jesus said in Mark and in Matthew that the traditions and doctrines of mankind make the word of God of no effect. What that means is, for instance, some of you may have heard, I was raised up in this, but some of you may have heard the statement, signs, wonders, miracles, healings passed away with the apostles. God doesn't want you prosperous. Money's the root of all evil. And that is a tradition and a doctrine of man that has been taught to the body of Christ. And it's not true because it doesn't line up with the word of God. And so when somebody that's been taught that God no longer heals, delivers, sets free, prospers, that you can identify with Christ that because of Jesus and you make him Lord of your life, you're the righteousness of God in Christ. When you hear that, but because of what you've been taught, the word of God is of no effect in your life. It won't work. But that's what Jesus came so we could have that. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Colossians 2, 8. When we celebrate the birth of Jesus, his birth merely, he always existed, but God said he needed human flesh to have authority in this earth. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Do not accept anything anybody tells you. I don't care if it's me, Andrew Walmack, Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Seville, what you heard from Charles Capps, whoever. If it's not after Christ, don't accept it. If it's not after the anointing and the anointed word, don't accept it because you will be spoiled. It's the philosophy, doctrines, and traditions of man. Verse 23, 22, pardon me. Verse 22, 23, which things have indeed... Glory to God. I don't know. There must have been in last night, 
that anointed service they had, it just must have drained everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Which are all are to perish with the using. If you follow the doctrines of man and the commandments of man and the doctrines of men, you will perish. So with that being said, let's look at what the gospel is. Let's start with 1 Timothy 3, chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come to thee shortly. Now this is Paul writing, and now what he's going to say is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Next verse. But I, if I tarry long, thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Now the house of God, we can call a building, but it's also your body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Next verse. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What is that mystery? If Satan knew this mystery, he would have never crucified the Lord of glory. God was manifest in the flesh. It was God manifest in the body of the baby Jesus. That's what it says, right? God was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. That happened when he rose up out of hell seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It is vitally important that we believe in the virgin birth. Some translations have that Mary was a young woman. She was not a young woman, she was a virgin. That is what's vitally important to realize. Because even today, when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you believe also that God raised Jesus from the dead. But you also believe that Jesus came in the flesh, that he was born as a baby. The Spirit of God came forth from Mary's womb, a baby. That's important because even back in the early church, right in the beginning, in 1 John and other places we read about it, they were denying the fact that Jesus came as a human being. Called Gnosticism. There's still a lot of that in the church today and you get it through doctrines and traditions of man. Because they said all flesh is evil, therefore, take note of this. Jesus could not have come in a human body since they separated flesh. Their flesh is evil. Nobody's flesh is evil. It's the soul realm, your way of thinking, the fact that we were born sinners because of Adam. And they say because all flesh is evil, Jesus didn't come with, in flesh. And therefore, because all flesh is evil, it doesn't matter what you do. Let me tell you. Because we're forgiven, past, present, and future sins, people have picked up Gnosticism saying it doesn't matter what you do. It absolutely matters. The minute you step into Satan's playground, you become his toy. Remember that. God has forgiven you because of the blood of Jesus. But what we do does count. What we believe does count. And it's our choice. God never forces us. Amen. Let's look at Genesis 3.15, the first time we hear actually the gospel the being preached, Genesis 3.15, and here God is speaking to Adam and Eve after they ate of the tree. The sin wasn't eating of the tree so much as the fact they disobeyed God. They believed a lie about God. They believed God was holding out on them. And they believed Satan and thought they could get something without God today. Do you think you can go forward 
because of who you are on your own instead of needing God, then you're deceived as Eve was. That was her deception. So God is saying, hey, I'm going to fix this. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Women don't have seed. And it shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Here is the gospel. Jesus took on flesh in the womb of Mary, was born in Bethlehem a baby, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. He indeed grew, was crucified, went into hell and took away the keys of death, hell and the grave from Satan. He indeed bruised his head, bruises his head there means take away the authority that Adam gave to him. Therein is the gospel. That's the first time God preached it. That's where it started. And now we know, we said that God upholds all things by the word of his power was absolutely essential that it came forth. And it took years and years and years of God speaking through man, finding a person that would speak his word. We heard the word this morning. Is there any faithful? God's looking for faithful people who will stand and speak his word so he can do what he wants to do. Luke chapter 1, verse 27. Luke 1, 27. So an angel came to Mary, a virgin, a spouse to a man. That means they were not married as having a marriage ceremony back then. A spouse to a man, they were engaged. Whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. It had to be from the house of David. There is not one word in the word of God that's unimportant. They're all important. Mary, can you just start thinking, Mary, a virgin, probably around 15, but don't fight about that. That can be a tradition. I don't know how old she was. It doesn't say how old she was. She was a young woman. She was a virgin. Next verse. Hallelujah. Then Joseph, her husband, no, 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 no. Still in Luke, chapter 1, verse 27, now verse 28. Please. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among, art thou among women. I want you to understand something. It was really something for Mary to become impregnated with the word of God. She was probably gossiped about, spoken evil about. But I want you all to understand, you also are blessed because of Jesus and highly favored. And yes, we honor what Mary did, but anytime anyone believes the word of God and steps out and acts on it, they will be persecuted for righteousness sake. There is always persecution. It is wrong to lift Mary up higher than anybody else. Even Jesus didn't do it. When he said, when they came to him and said, your mothers and brothers are here, he said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? These all are my mothers and brothers. To lift Mary up to a place she shouldn't have and to look to her and basically almost bow down to her, to reverence her, to honor her above is idolatry. And that's a doctrine and tradition of man that has led people into bondage. We read the story and we miss what God is saying and next thing you know we're so focused on Mary, we miss the fact of what the word of God can do for us because of Jesus. And yes, I'm not belittling what Mary did, but we are not to lift her up to a place where it becomes idolatry. So we are all blessed and highly favored. Next verse. 
And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. It's not wrong when something comes to you. It's as even if an angel of light comes to you, if it doesn't preach the gospel, don't believe it. It's not wrong to wonder what you're hearing or what you're dreaming, where it's coming from. Don't just accept everything. If an angel should appear to you, don't be worshiping angels. Don't be asking for angels to appear. Don't idolize angels. Don't expect angels. If they come, so be it. But always wonder where it's from. Making sure it lines up with the word of God. Next verse. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Zero, when you hear from God, zero fear. If it's God telling you to do something, you can know it's good. And you never have to be in fear because of it. And she found favor with God. Why did Mary find favor with God? Well, if he chose Mary, it tells me she was a godly woman. It tells me she honored her parents. It tells me she knew the word of God. She was trained in the Torah, so to speak. She had to have been knowing what the word of God was all about. When we don't know the word and we hear from God, we won't know if it's God or not because we don't know the word. So obviously Mary knew the word. Next verse. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. She must have been versed in the word enough to know that a virgin was going to bring forth a son. She would have read and studied the prophets. Next verse. And he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Next verse. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Next verse. Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She was not questioning God. She was in the natural, thinking, How can this be possible? Because naturally it's impossible because she was not with a man. She did not know a man. She did not have sex with a man. Next verse. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The word of God planted in your heart will always produce. It will always produce. But we have to accept it. Next verse. And behold, your cousin Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Next verse. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And we hear that, and we hear that, and we hear that. Jesus could do no mighty works in his own hometown for one reason, unbelief. It's not impossible with God, but we can stop it so he can't do anything. And our unbelief will always stop God's move in our life. The word of God is not void of power. If Mary had rejected the word of God, she would not have conceived and bore forth a son. When the word of God comes to you, if you don't receive it, the word of God is still full of power, but it won't do any good in your life. And we hear often that your faith, Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. And we're so focused on our faith and what we have and what we've done. Instead of what Jesus has already done for us. The faith is believing what Jesus did. Remember, when that woman with the issue of blood went forth and she said she heard of Jesus. Faith comes by hearing. 
She heard, she heard, she heard of Jesus. And then she said, if I but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. Her faith acted, but she spoke. Faith, action is speaking. Paul said, I believe and therefore I speak. Do you speak what you believe? Or are you too afraid to voice what you believe because somebody might hear you? And what if it doesn't come to pass? Because you're in unbelief. Because you're in unbelief. What's not impossible to God was when she said, if I touch the hem of his garment, but Jesus said, I perceive virtue has gone out of me. Her faith released the power that was in Jesus for her. So really, it was the power of Jesus that healed her. But her faith released it. Your faith releases the healing power of Jesus that's in your spirit. As we heard Brother Friday say, we have God's DNA. And when we speak God's word, we're releasing that DNA in us. We're releasing that life in us. And things have to come from death to life. Then it's not impossible. Nothing's impossible to the word of God that's received and spoken and believed. Amen. But it's God's word that produces. It was the seed of God's word in Mary's womb that produced the child. Verse 8, 38. Luke 1, 38. And Mary said, and this is the word that came forth. God's looking for faithful. Mary said, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And when we're faithful and we see something in the word, we say, Behold, be it unto me according to the word. And the angel departed. Matthew 1, 18. So that's Mary. She's accepted it. God told her to call the son Jesus. You know, in heaven, before Jesus was born, Jesus always existed. We saw that. He did not have the name of Jesus. He was the Son of God, but he was not named Jesus. But that isn't spelled out per se in the word, so that's... Anyway, and Mary said, no, Matthew 118. Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise when his, his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Next verse. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to pull, put her away privately. He was going to divorce her. He was a just man. But he didn't want to throw Mary under the bus, so to speak to save his own reputation. He wasn't going to humiliate Mary to save his own reputation. But he was a just man. And obviously we know he must have been very well versed in the scriptures. Because Jesus, God would not have chosen Jesus' earth parents to be ignorant of the word or to be slothful. Because Jesus, it said, he grew in stature and in wisdom. So obviously Jesus was taught. Fathers, this is so important. That you be that example for your children. But he should have, being a just man, he should have, according to the Torah, had her stoned. But he didn't want to do that. He loved her. He had compassion. Next verse. But while he thought on these things, while he thought on these things, the things of Mary being pregnant and him putting her away privately and not having her stoned, while he thought on these things, people, it's so important that we spend some time with our Heavenly Father, with Jesus, with Holy Spirit, in fellowship with him so we don't make rash decisions. Abraham should have done the same when Sarah suggested he go in unto Hagar. Think of the problems that would have been saved today. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, 
for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Next verse. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Notice, there is no place in the word that tells us Mary talked to Joseph before he had this dream. But there is a confirmation. God told Joseph to call his name Jesus. God told Mary, call his name Jesus. There was a confirmation for them that they both heard from God separately. And that's important to be in agreement. So Joseph was a just man. There is tradition that is said that Joseph was just a poor carpenter and there was no room in the inn and there's all sorts of things and the manger was wooden. Well, we know that's not possible because it would have been rotten by today. But stop and think. Apart from what people might say or research might say, and they use the fact that Joseph was probably a poor man. One, poor men weren't taxed. But two, Would God have poor people raise his son? And you might say, sure, there's no problem with being poor. Hold it. If you knew the blessing, which he obviously knew the Abrahamic covenant, because he was a just man, he was raised in the word. We know that simply because we know God's history. All the way through, Noah was a righteous man. Abraham, mind you, he really messed up. I don't know. I wouldn't want Abraham for a husband. Can you imagine, Sarah? Just let me tell him. Tell him you're my sister so that they won't kill me. Doesn't matter what they do to you, Sarah. That, that's just fine. I mean, like... Really? Praise God, he was on her side. He was on her side. Anyway, so we know Joseph knew the word, and God called all these people Noah. He must have been wealthy. The Bible doesn't tell us he was, but he must have been. Where else would he get the finances to build that ark? And nobody else was obviously helping him because only Noah and his sons were righteous people. They hadn't been infected by the Nephilim, etc. So we know he was wealthy. Look, even though Abraham, and I know it was before the law, but Abraham did what Abraham did. He was very wealthy. I mean, when you're under the blessing of God, even when you, Abraham lied to that king, and yet God told that king to bless Abraham. Your blessing will come. So obviously, Joseph, knowing the word, walking under the Abrahamic covenant, knowing the blessing of God, had to be a wealthy man. Amen. However, that's just judging and looking at what God's done. But it's encouraging for us. I believe it says in the end time, the wealth of the sinner stored up for the righteous. When our heart's right, we should be so wealthy. We should have been able to build our church and school ten times over. We're looking at what we have in the natural instead of what God stored up for us already. We are looking naturally instead of spiritually. And it will always stop us. So that's Joseph. Who God called. Let's go to Luke chapter 2, verse 9. The shepherds. These are people that, one, we saw why perhaps God called Mary and Joseph. Why did he appear first to the shepherds? And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Whenever the angel showed up, they were afraid. Next verse. And the angel said unto them the same thing that you find over and over, fear not. And God is saying to us this morning, don't be afraid of what's happening out there. 
Don't be afraid of what you see out there. Don't be afraid of persecution, but keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Next verse. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, a Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Next verse. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Well, the shepherds knew. Now, this was a cave Jesus was in. Swaddling clothes are what you wrap the lambs in so they wouldn't damage their legs. When the shepherds went in and saw, they would know. That was a sign from God letting them know they were in the right place at the right time. Next verse. And suddenly there was the angel with a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now it wasn't a silent night, it was holy, it was very loud. When you get a whole group of angels praising God, it is not quiet. Hallelujah. Just stop and think about it. It says in the heavens it's noisy. If you don't like noise and shouting and praising God and hearing glory given to God down here, it's going to take you some training when you get to heaven to be able to put up with it. Because that's what's going on up there. But what happened? Why were they so excited? Jesus, Savior to all people, what is it? Goodwill, peace toward all men. And people have taken that. Here's another tradition. Peace among men. There is less peace among men today than there ever has been. And often, even in the body of Christ, there isn't peace. That's where more peace should be, less gossip, less harm than any place else. The body of Christ, Jesus said, you'll, they'll know you by your love. The minute you have any evil thought, any negative thought towards anybody in the body of Christ, stop it. Repent. Speak love. Speak who you are in Christ and that you love. Goodwill, but that goodwill is the barrier the veil separating us from the Holy of Holies, separating us from fellowship with our Heavenly Father. That sin barrier is broken. Now here you can see it hadn't happened yet. But here's another example of God calling those things that be not as though they are until they become. Jesus hadn't been crucified or raised from the dead yet. But God declared... He's the Savior, and God had complete faith in his son Jesus that he wouldn't collapse, and he said, I don't have a problem with you anymore. Your sin has been taken care of. All you have to do is believe Jesus. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. And you now become my child, and that separation is gone. You have complete peace and goodwill with me because of Jesus. It's our peace with God. God is not mad. He said he wouldn't be in... Isaiah 54, I'll not be wroth with you. I'll not be angry with you anymore. And in John, he says, I'll draw an all judgment unto me. I'm paying the price. God is judging me. I'm taking all the judgment for every sin, for everything that's ever happened. I'm taking it on me. And you'll never have to pay for it. As long as you accept me. There's only one sin that'll send somebody to hell. And that's rejecting Jesus. That's it. Nothing else. You reject Jesus, you've no hope because he's the only way. Jesus is the good shepherd. Shepherds were humble. They were considered low. Jesus is the good shepherd. He protects, feeds. Think of what a shepherd does. And Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He looks after us. He protects us. His healing power flows for us. Jesus didn't come to bring peace horizontally, 
but vertically. But once we have peace with God, vertically, you and I are to walk in peace, horizontally. And that's something the world should notice. Let's go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Now, Matthew chapter 2, I apologize. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Matthew 2, 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Here's another tradition that people have had problems with because on Christmas cards, there's so many Christmas carols that are so contrary to the word of God. But on the Christmas carol, there were three wise men. And those three wise men came, and it shows them bowing down, worshiping Jesus in the manger. There may have been three wise men. I don't know. There may have been 300. I don't know. But I know there was more than one, because the Bible says wise men. So there were two or more wise men. Why do we think we have to add to the word of God in order to make it realistic for us? I don't know how many, and you don't either. So let's not speculate. We don't need to know. We need to know that wise men did come from the east to Jerusalem. So let's not get hung up on a Christmas card. Let's look at the next verse. And they came saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Doesn't say he went to Herod. He might have just been asking the people in the streets. We don't know. But at this point, it doesn't say he went to Herod. Herod eventually looked for him. But it doesn't say he went to Herod. For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Are come to worship him. And that's important. These wise men came to worship Jesus. So we see the shepherds who were considered low being told and worshiping Jesus. And no matter how high your stature or how much finances you have or how prosperous you might be or what man has called you or how they might have elevated you, you still need Jesus. And you still need to bow down and worship him. Verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go search diligently for the young child. So now we know he was no longer, Jesus was no longer a baby. He was a young child. Now I know research has been done and they say he was approximately two years old. The Bible doesn't tell us, but it does tell us he wasn't a baby. Now I'm just going to throw this out there and I'm not saying this happened. But they got, could God have sent that aim, that star, for these wise men to see two years before Jesus was born? Because then they no longer saw the star, is that not correct? But then they saw it again, and they were excited. So could Jesus, he was now a young child, he wasn't in the manger, he was in the house, but could he have been a year old? You and I don't know. But I was thinking about that, and I thought, why did the star disappear and then reappear? I don't know. But it did. And to me, that's telling me that God might lead us, and we see something, and we're going towards that goal. They saw that star, and we get a word from God, and we're going towards it. And suddenly, we don't hear anything more. But we keep going towards where God was leading us, and we still don't see any more. But he hasn't told us to stop, and he hasn't told us to do something else, so we keep going farther. And then all of a sudden, we're at an end, but we need to have some direction. And God... He sent that star. He will give you another word. He will show you where to go from this point. He never just leaves you there. He always has direction for you. But don't make something up like a tradition. Don't 
breathe into yourself some silly idea that God's led me here, now I don't see the star. So am I supposed to make camp here? Am I supposed to go north? Am, oh, maybe he's leading me to Hawaii. It's really nice there. Maybe that's his destination for me. Wait to hear. When they saw the star, they could move forward. God will never leave you just hanging there. Ever. Next verse. And when they heard the king, he departed. They departed. Now they were told, once they locate Jesus, go back and let Herod know. Because Herod said, I want to worship him also. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them. The star reappeared for them. They saw it. If they had seen that star all along, they wouldn't have stopped to ask people. Until it came and stood over where the young child was. Next verse. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When you hear the word of God, you should be expressing exceeding great joy. Next verse. And when they were come into the house, so again, we know he was in a house. Jesus was no longer in the cave in a manger. And they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. These magi worshipped a child, but they knew he was a king. They understood who Jesus was. Do you understand today who Jesus is? Are you ready to fall down and worship him and putting him first place in your life? If you worship Jesus, you really almost worship the Word because the Word became flesh and the Word becomes so valuable to you. You won't let yourself get sidetracked to the left or the right with other ideas. And they fell down and worshipped him and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And the reason they thought it was three wise men is because there were three gifts. We don't know how much of each gift was there. But we can gather it was a multitude of gifts. Magi did not worship a king and just have a little bit. Next verse. And being warned of God in a dream, and this is Mary, that they should, uh, pardon me, and being, re, and being warned of God in a dream, the wise man, the Magi, that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Take note. Take note. Who do you obey above all? Do you obey the law when it's against what God's telling you to do? They disobeyed the king of the land, Herod, but obeyed the king of kings. God is always number one. His word is always to be obeyed. He is always above all authority, all dominion, all domain. The only time, and don't use that as an excuse to say, well, I obey God and I can go 120 in a 100 mile an hour zone. You're not obeying God. You left late and that's on you. That's on me, I know. But when the law tells us to do something that isn't against the word of God, we obey the law. But if the law of the land, because it tells us they are there as ministers for our good, and if they're telling us to do something that's not for our good, they are not obeying God, and we don't have to obey them. And it's very clear. Obeying Herod, he would have been after Jesus. So they obeyed God. Always obey God first. Amen. Always obey the God first. Number one, first. So they departed into their own country and went another way. Later we can read where Mary and Joseph were told to leave and go to Egypt. Because somebody, Herod, was after him. Parents, you are responsible to protect your children. Not the government, not the teachers. Parents, grandparents, you're there to protect your children. And if you have to go somewhere else for your children to be protected, as Mary and Joseph left, 
their home country and went to Egypt for a time. You do what you have to do under God's direction to protect your children at all costs. It's our responsibility as parents to know and understand what they are brainwashing our children with. And I call it brainwashing because today I'm not going to get political, but I can give you examples of what's being taught and what's the results of it. But parents, you have the wisdom of God, the understanding of God. Use that wisdom and understanding to protect your children. And pray also for the leadership of the church, for me, that I will not back down and be afraid of reprisal by speaking the word of God to you. It's our responsibility as a church to give you the truth. Your children have to know what the church believes and we have, you have to know what we believe and that we're standing with you and that we're in agreement with you. Hallelujah. The wise men, they came and worshiped Jesus. They bowed down and gave him gifts. Please stand. At this time, you have an opportunity to worship Jesus with your gifts, with your tithes and offerings. Ushers, wait on the people. Carolyn.